Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, just like you all, I seem to be a lifelong learner, so I was in school for a long time uh, to get to have this job that I have, which I very much enjoy. And my uh, passion in life is understanding pituitary disorders. And um, I, I was pleasantly somewhat surprised about six months ago to get an email from um, your organizer saying that someone, one of you, had, maybe more, had requested to have a lecture about the pituitary gland and what it does and some of the interesting disorders that occur within the pituitary gland. So I was uh, more than happy to get the invitation to come and speak with you today. I would say that um, pituitary disease is a rare set of disorders, so um, this is not something that we see every day. But I think that um, I think there's a lot of interest in it. There's a lot of um, there are a lot of people who think that they have pituitary disorders, and it's my job to help sort it out and determine whether they truly do or not. So th today's lecture is going to be a lot of physiology. I'm going to kind of introduce you to the pituitary, let you know kind of what it is, where it is, and what it does. I'd be happy to take questions along the way if something comes up that uh, you'd like to quiz me about. I'd be happy to answer that. Um, so let's just get started. Do, is there a pointer, or do you guys ever have a pointer, or we just do this on? No laser? Okay. I think I can do it on the screen if I want to point something out. <coughs> All right, so I think the first question we should start out is, with is where is the pituitary gland? So when I tell, talk to patients and I'm telling them where the issue may be, I say if your head is a ball, the pituitary gland is in the center of that ball. It's at what we call the base of the skull. So the pituitary gland is this small pink gland that's hanging off the bottom of the brain. Many people come to me having been told that they have a tumor in their pituitary gland. And I will say that unfortunately that's all that they've heard. And most people come thinking that they have a brain tumor. And I'm pleased to tell them that one, their problem is not in their brain. It's in a gland that's very near their brain. It's in a gland that's attached to their brain. But it's not actually a brain tumor. And also thankfully, the majority of the tumors that occur within the pituitary are non-cancerous, unlike many uh, brain tumors that are much more um, onerous. So the pituitary hangs from the part of the brain called the hypothalamus, and it's connected by a stalk called the infundibulum. And this is a blown up representation of that pink area. There's, we divide it into the anterior part and the posterior part. When we're being formed in utero, the anterior part grows up from your tongue and the posterior part comes down from your brain and they fuse together. So the front part is, is uh, more like um, normal kind of actually tongue, uh, modified tongue tissue and the back is actually neural tissue. And they're a little bit different in the hormones that they make. And that's what I'm gonna talk a lot about today. The way the pituitary and the, and the brain, the part of the brain called the hypothalamus, my colors aren't very showing up very well. The way the uh, hypothalamus and the pituitary control the hormone systems in your body is a very elegant system. So we have a number of inputs. We have neurologic inputs, pain, stress, illness, sleep, our circadian rhythms, what we've eaten. These inputs to our brain all get coordinated and signals sent to this area called the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus then sends out signals to the pituitary. So on the left we have the green uh, arrows indicate stimulatory uh, inputs, which means hormones released from the brain that travel down to the pituitary to stimulate the pituitary to make something. And vice versa, on uh, the red arrows are to suggest that the brain also sends out in inhibitory signals. So second by second, the brain is coordinating our external stimuli to send signals to the pituitary to say, how should you respond? So then the pituitary releases a number of different hormones that control a lot of what I call the end organ hormones. So, and then those end organ, hormone, uh, end organ glands then release hormones that feed back and suppress or stimulate the brain to make more of its uh, stimulatory or inhibitory hormone. So I tell people it's like a thermostat. So if 
the end organs, the end organ uh, glands or, or uh, hormones are not being made enough. A signal goes back to the brain to say, turn it up, let's work harder. Or if you're making too much, then the brain uh, suppresses its production of its hormones to keep everything in check. And this is going on second by second, minute by minute, to keep these hormone systems in, uh, in good balance. So I've, I've got a pretty complicated slide here, but I think the pituitary often gets called the master gland. And I think it's because it's so important in regulating most, but not all, of the glands in our body. So I'm going to go through each of the hormones, tell you what they are, and tell you what they stimulate. So starting at the top, the, um, so we clearly have the pituitary. The pituitary makes a hormone called TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. I think that's a hormone that a lot of people are familiar with. TSH stimulates the thyroid to make thyroxine, which is the primary thyroid hormone. Then we have a hormone called prolactin made by the pituitary gland. That it's pr it probably has a lot of functions, but what we think is its main function is to stimulate lactation after uh, delivery. Growth hormone, um, I'm going to talk a lot more about growth hormone later, but growth hormone stimulates the liver to make another hormone called IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor type 1, and we'll talk about its effects more. There are a myriad of effects in the body. ACTH, adrenocorticotropin hormone, stimulates the adrenal gland to make cortisol. And there's a lot of information out there, both true and untrue, about cortisol that I want to talk about a little bit later. Vasopressin is a hormone made by the back part of the pituitary, the posterior pituitary. And its primary job is to cause the kidney to hold on to water. So when you don't make enough vasopressin, you're urinating excessively and then becoming very thirsty. And people who don't make any of that hormone drink on the order of two to four gallons or more sometimes a day of water to keep up with the loss of water they have when they don't have that hormone. Oxytocin is a, is a hormone that's in the news a lot nowadays. They call it the love hormone. Um, what we know historically about oxytocin is that it's important for a uterine contraction for in, during delivery. But there's a lot of, lot of active research right now, and I want to be cautious about saying what we know and what we don't know about oxytocin. But it seems to also be involved in bonding relationships with people. So there have been studies looking at oxytocin levels when people are um, in situations where they need to trust others, and then giving oxytocin to determine whether it affects uh, various uh, trust-type situations. And then finally, uh, LH and FSH, luteinizing hor hormone and follicle stimulating hormone, are the hormones that stimulate our gonads. So in women, that stimulates the ovary to make estrogen, estradiol, and to um, allow ova eggs to mature. And in men, it stimulates the testes to make testosterone and to make mature sperm. So that's a Obviously, a laundry list of a number of hormones, but it shows you just how important the pituitary is in regulating so many of the hormone processes within our body. So, what I'm going to talk <clears throat> mostly about today are tumors that develop within the pituitary. And um, we use a number of terms, I think, that get thrown out there that um, we don't do a very good job of explaining. And so, just to kind of start at the basic level, a tumor is an overgrowth of cells. If that tumor is benign, meaning not, not going to metastasize, pieces aren't going to break off and go somewhere else, we call it a, tum a benign tumor within a gland is called an adenoma. The vast majority of problems in the pituitary are adenomas, benign tumors within the pituitary. The type of tumor that a person gets depends on the cell that went wrong. So if you'll go back and think about that first picture I showed you with the front part of the pituitary, it had lots of different types of cells. Each one of those hormones that I mentioned comes from a different type of cell, and there are five basic cell types that make the thyroid-stimulating hormone, the ACTH, the growth hormone, the prolactin, and LH and FSH. There are five different types. And in a person, one of those cells goes wrong starts dividing excessively. And depending on which one goes wrong, it determines the problem that a person has. So it de determines which hormone is made in excess. So um, and I, wanna, I wanna mention one thing, which is the last is non-functioning. It is extremely rare for a person to have a tumor from the cells that stimulate the gonads to make a hormonal syndrome. 
we, we develop those tumors, they, don't ju they don't, just don't cause a hormonal syndrome, so we call them non-functioning because we don't see any physical hormonal problems related to them other than the fact that their tumors develop and can cause problems just based on the size of the tumor. That's what I'm going to talk about right now. So pituitary tumors. They are actually very, very common. Estimates put it somewhere maybe about 10% of all people have a small adenoma within their pituitary. So that's a lot. A lot of people have this. Thankfully, though, very few of them are clinically significant. But I think it's important to know this because so many people get MRIs now. We get them for headaches, we get them when we have an injury, and oftentimes these very small spots are found within the pituitary. I see many people sent to me to say, is this causing a problem or not? And it's very appropriate to have an initial check to say, is it a problem or not? And thankfully, for the most part, I tell people, this is something that is not causing you any problem, it's not making any extra hormone, and because it's quite small, it's very unlikely to cause you a problem in your lifetime. But there are some that do cause problems, and we, we break them down first based on size. So we've um, drawn the line at one centimeter, 10 millimeters, to say a tumor less than 10 millimeters is unlikely in a person's lifetime to cause a significant problem with respect to size. We just know epidemiologically this is what most people have, and they usually don't get bigger over a person's lifetime. On the other hand, macroadenomas, tumors greater than a centimeter, are much more likely to be tumors that are going to grow. They've already proven that they can get to a centimeter. They may well get up uh, to larger size. So in reality, only about 0.1% of people actually have a pituitary ab abnormality or a tumor that's going to cause them a problem, either based on size or because that tumor makes too much hormone. So this is an MRI of the pituitary. This is looking right at someone with their face taken off. So if you think about it, it's like looking right at me. My eyes would be out in front of that. Um, let me show this. And this is a schematic of the region right here. So this is the pituitary gland, that rectangle, which is this ball here connected to the brain. Now, the really unfortunate anatomical situation is that the nerves to the eyes run right over top of the pituitary. So this is called the optic chiasm right here, and that's right here on the MRI. So when a person develops a pretty significantly sized pituitary tumor, one of the first things they'll come in to say to me is that they have been losing vision. Now, many of these tumors grow very slowly over a person's lifetime. So they'll say, yeah, I've started not to be able to see very well, but it's been going on for years and years. Whereas other people come in and say, over the last month, I've lost my peripheral vision. So obviously, the time with which someone has had one of these tumors it can be quite different. They can be very slow growing or very rapidly growing in rare cases. So this, again, is showing you what it looks like to have a tumor in this region. So this is the normal pituitary. This is a small microadenoma, that little gray circle there, not touching the nerves to the eyes. And this is a macroadenoma, a very large tumor that you see extending upward and pushing on the nerves to the eyes. These are two different tumors. And you can see here that that person's chiasm, which are the optic nerves, are stretched up over top of that tumor. And that person very likely came in with a vision problem. So that's a great question. So headaches are certainly a finding that's seen in some pituitary tumors, but, we ha but not, clearly not everyone. There will be people with very large pituitary tumors that never have pain. Certain types, those that make growth hormone, appear to be much more likely associated with pain, but it's probably not due to size. It's probably due to the growth hormone and the effects of the growth hormone. So there does not appear to be a definite correlation between size and pain. We generally do say, though, that tumors less than a centimeter are very unlikely to be the cause of headaches. And we know that just based on studies that have been done, looking at people who have headaches, taking them out, and the headaches don't get better. And that's important because I've already told you so many people have these. And people get MRIs to try to figure out their headaches. 
And when they're found to have these spots, many people come to say, take this out. This may be the cause of my headache. But we know that in most, in the vast majority of people, very small spots don't cause headaches. Good question. Um, so this is classically what we, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And um, she really wasn't able to function very well. But I was surprised when she told me how they went in and removed the, um, the tumor. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show some pictures. Okay. But if there, do you have a question before we go? I just wondered, they went in through her mouth? So, so some go through the mouth, some go through the nose. We actually go through the nose. But we, you get to the same spot, and I'm going to show you a picture of how you get there in just a minute. So, when, um, so headache, it can be a presentation if a person has a large tumor or particularly a growth hormone secreting tumor. This is what we call the classic presentation of what the term is, is bitemporal hemianopsia, which means you don't see on the sides. You don't see on your, your temporal vision. So these are what we call visual fields. I don't know if you've ever had them, and they're done a lot of times for glaucoma, where you'll sit and they'll shine the lights around. So when a person can't see on the periphery, this is, what, um, this is what generally the pattern will be. Now, it's always amazing to me. People will come in and have this type of pattern, and they won't even know it. They'll have, they will have it, uh, it'll come to their attention because they'll tell me, well, I play golf, and I stopped being able to see where my ball went. Or I'm a, base, I'm a softball player, and I stopped being able to see the pitches come in. And it just, it's so subtle to them, and it comes along so slowly that they don't notice it until um, it's actually quite severe. And I think what that means is that our eyes are so good at moving back and forth that we compensate for these very severe uh, deficiencies in our vision. No, so macular degeneration affects the back part of the eyeball, so uh, the retina of the eyeball. This actually is well back behind the eyeball and actually affects the nerves that go to the eyeball. So um, separate, separate type of entity. One, one th other thing that I want to mention is that if a person has a big enough tumor within their pituitary, it can block the normal function of the pituitary. We call that hypopituitarism. So sometimes all those hormone systems that I talked about, they can become low because a person has a large tumor in that area that's, a f that's decreasing their normal pituitary function. So this is just kind of a breakdown of the different types of tumors. The, the majority of people who have significant tumors have what we call a prolactinoma, which makes too much of the hormone prolactin. About 10 to 15 percent make too much ACTH, which makes them make too much cortisol. We're going to talk much more about that. Another 10 percent make too much growth hormone. We'll talk about that. And then these are the non-functioning tumors that just cause their problem by getting bigger and causing headaches and vision problems. So high prolactin levels, this is the majority, majority of patients that I see are people who come having been diagnosed with high prolactin. It's usually a woman that's having breast milk production after, significantly after delivery of a baby. Very occasionally I have men who have breast milk production. Men certainly can develop gynecomastia, which is breast tissue enlargement um, and tenderness. What is commonly found is hypogonadism, which means high prolactin decreases those hormones that stimulate testosterone and estrogen production. So many women come in having their periods have stopped or men having low testosterone, and they have symptoms of that. Um, and infertility comes from having that hypogonadism. So this is just one example of a patient that I saw who had a very large prolactinoma. So this tumor extends all the way up to the nerves to her eyes, all the way out here to compress the left side of her brain here, so it's just left to right shifted. And so this was a really large tumor that caused her to have block of the normal flow of cerebrospinal fluid. So she was, had terrible headaches and was confused when I saw her, and her prolactin level was 2,500 and normal is 20. So it was a, an amazing tumor, but what's even more amazing about these tumors is they are remarkably sensitive to a type of medicine called a dopamine agonist. So the two types of dopamine agonist are called bromocryptine and cabernoline. 
There are medicines that bind to receptors on these tumors, dopamine receptors, and they literally just make them melt away. So the prolactin levels go down and the pituitary tumors decrease. So this was her merely, I think, I think it was six months later, not more than that. So you can see that the bulk of that tumor has come down away from her optic chiasm, this bulge that went out into her brain is now gone. There will always still be some tumor left. Doesn't make it go away completely, but it's really amazing how quickly people can come in with severe vision decline and within a few days they'll call me and say my vision's back to normal. So these medicines in this particular type of tumor really are remarkable in how well they work. So you can see her prolactin went all the way down to normal. Even though she has tumor left, the medicine both shrinks the tumor as well as decreases the production of prolactin. Now, it doesn't always work that way. There are some prolactinomas that are resistant to these medicines, but thankfully, it works in over 90% of the time. Once you shrink the tumor, Well, usually if a tumor like this, they'll be on that medicine lifelong. So I usually start them out on a high dose, particularly if they're symptomatic, and then I can decrease them down to a very low dose. The medicines are very well tolerated, and it's a type of medicine you take one pill a week. So it's easy, easy medicine to take and works very well. No side effects? Very few. Sometimes some nausea, headache, lightheadedness. Occasionally there's been some interesting reports that, so dopamine is a, is a neurotransmitter chemical that's involved in a lot of the circuitry within the brain. So one would think that it might cause problems, but usually it doesn't. But in the rare case, there are reports of people having increased OCD symptoms. So they become um, obsessive gamblers or have issues with anger issues. Very rarely, thankfully, very rarely do I see that. Yes, sir? Removed surgically? So the standard of care for a prolactinoma is to treat it with medicine because the medicine works so quickly and so well. One, one thing that I didn't mention, I should have, is these circles right here, these are your carotid arteries, extremely important arteries taking blood to your brain. So you want, if at all possible, to keep a surgeon away from those arteries. <laughs> so, so, um, surgeons very wisely know they should keep their sharp objects away from these arteries. So there's actually a kind of a line here that is the lateral boundary of this area we call the cella. And then this region we call the cavernous sinus over here. Neurosurgeons do not operate in the cavernous sinus due to risks to injury to the, to the carotid artery and injury to the nerves that run within that cavernous sinus, which are the nerves that control the movement of your eyes. So the surgeons cannot get into that place safely. So you, it is, what happens in many of these big prolactinomas is that you cannot get a surgical, surgical cure. So why send a person to surgery if you're just going to have them on medicine anyway? The medicine works very well, um, and they're going to be on it after, because there's going to be residual tumor. So that's why we start with the medicine and usually stay with the medicine. There are very rare, there are cases where people don't tolerate the medicine, and we'll send them to surgery and try to get out as much as possible. And cases where the tumor might be very small and right in the center of the gland, and a person, young person doesn't want to be on medicine their whole life then you, you could think about it. But I will say, vast majority of people, it's such an easy medicine to take, just take the medicine. But if you do have surgery, my question was, is it likely to return? Not if you get it all out. And what if you don't? What, what's your problem? It'll grow back. <laughs> so that's, that's always the issue with these tumors. Is they don't, a lot of tumors, when we think about tumors, they're a ball. When a surgeon goes in there to take them out, they get margins, they say, trying to get around it to take the whole tumor out. When the sur I'm going to show you a picture of how this surgery is done. When the surgeons go in to take out pituitary tumors, this is through an endoscope, through the nose, and it comes out like toothpaste, piece by piece by piece, tiny little pieces. So they never get what we think of as a surgical margin. They try to do the best they can to get out all the visible tumor, but it's also they're, they're operating in a very high real, real estate area where they have to be very cautious not to be too aggressive. They don't want to hit the optic nerve, they don't want to hit the carotid artery, and they want to preserve as much of the normal pituitary as they can. So when they're operating on benign tumors, 
they try to be cautious. So because of that, it's not uncommon to have some tumor left. How is the medicine they administer? Oral medicine, just a pill, once a week. Injected? No, just a pill, just oral. Oh, Eat, sorry. swallow it once a week, yep. All right, so now I'm going to kind of focus on some of the, the actual request for my talk was to talk about, I think, bizarre pituitary disorders. So I think, <laughs> <laughs> so I got to get to the bizarre. So um, but it, it, they're bizarre in that they're rare, and they cause, um, they cause particular clinical findings that we all will be able to now see in patients. So when you're walking on the street and you see a pe person that has these, tell them my name, let them know they need to come and see me. Um, so growth hormone. Growth hormone has gotten a lot of press recently. You turn, you turn on the internet, you get on the internet, it's not hard to find a growth hormone. People call it the fountain of youth hormone. Um, most of us believe that that is over touting its, its uh, roles. I'm going to talk about that a little more in a second. But what growth hormone does, it's made by the pituitary, it stimulates the liver to make this hormone IGF-1. So both growth hormone and IGF-1 then circulate out in the blood and bind to a lot of cells in our body. The primary things that we know are that they bind to muscle cells to increase muscle bulk. They bind to fat tissue, particularly what we call visceral fat, which is fat around the organs in the abdomen, and decrease visceral fat or keep it in check. And they bind, uh, it binds to bone. And in children, growth hormone's important for their long bones, their femurs, their humerus, to lengthen. And in adults and in children, growth hormone's important for them to accrue normal bone density, so thicken their bones. So clearly, all those things sound great. But most people, when, when I talk to them about the effects of growth hormone, every, everybody wants to have stronger muscles, less visceral fat, and stronger bones. But I always tell people growth hormone plays a very small role in each of these uh, processes. There are many, many other inputs to your muscle bulk, your visceral fat, and your bone density. So in children, growth hormone deficiency um, is a relatively rare finding, but this is just a, this is a picture of fraternal twins that were five years old. And this, the little boy, it, whoops, is about six inches taller than uh, his uh, fraternal twin sister. Now, it's a boy and a girl. It's not, you can't compare, these are not identical twins. But um, six inches, <laughs> right? <laughs> so six inches, though, is a lot of difference in height by, by five years of age. And so in children, as you will recall, the way we determine whether a child is having an pro endocrine problem a lot of times is based on what goes on in their growth charts. So this is just a typical growth chart. I'm going to walk you through it. Oh, it seems that the, the dates, have, the ages have been cut off here on the bottom. But this is three months, six months, nine months, one year, 15 months, year and a half, uh, year and three quarters. So this is a small chart. These were not this child. This is just another growth chart. But what, this is height. And what, the way these uh, graphs are presented is that middle line, the darker line, represents the average child, so the 50 percent, 50 percentile curve. So this child started out growing in height just like everybody else in the 50 percentile curve. But then at about nine months, 12 months, started to say what we say is falling off the curve, which means the height stopped growing along that kind of average curve. And now that child became shorter than the average child. And the same with the weight. Kind of, kind of dropped off a little bit less severe than the height, but also smaller. So there are a number, when, when kids fall off the growth chart in terms of height, there are many different causes of that. I want to be cautious to say this, that growth hormone isn't the only cause of that, but it's clearly one of the causes of having a short stature. And pediatric endocrinologists will then see these these young children hopefully early, because the earlier this is diagnosed, the sooner intervention can be made. One, to determine whether it truly is growth hormone, or two, to determine if it's something else more, more serious. But growth hormone, we've decided, is a dis growth hormone deficiency in children, we've decided, is a disorder that should be treated. Primarily what it does to treat it is to increase linear growth in these children. So there's 
complicated testing that's done to prove that they have low growth hormone. And then when they're shown to have growth hormone deficiency, they're then started on growth hormone treatments. They generally take a shot every three to seven days of growth hormone. It's an exceedingly expensive drug. So on the order of ten to $15,000 a year, there have been some estimates that per centimeter of growth costs about $20,000 in these children. So it's a, it's a really expensive therapy, but it works amazingly well in children who have isolated growth hormone deficiency to bring them back up to their predicted height. So um, that's, that's how we deal with uh, kids with growth hormone deficiency. Now let's switch a little bit to adults. <clears throat> what we know about growth hormone in adults is that growth hormone declines with age. That's just what happens. It, when you're young, it's low. During puberty, it shoots way up to have that, you know, when you had your growth spurt, that was growth hormone being released, part, part of its growth hormone being released. And then over life, there's this, there's this decline in growth hormone production. So this has gotten a lot of internet hype that, um, you know, that if you were to give back human growth hormone, that we can reverse a lot of the effects of aging. Well, a number of studies have been done, and there are many of athletes and various um, celebrities who, who really tout the beneficial effects of growth hormone. Um, this is, this is a, a panel or a, a graph here that I just wanted to point out. This was a, a meta-analysis looking at what does growth hormone do in people who truly have a deficiency versus just healthy people wanting to try to have the fountain of youth. So, um, and let me say that true growth hormone deficiency in adults generally occurs because they have had a tumor in their pituitary that has blocked their normal production of growth hormone or because they've had radiation to their pituitary for some reason. Those are, those are people that we truly believe have adult growth hormone deficiency versus growth hormone administered to healthy adults. So it does appear that fat mass, particularly visceral fat mass, is reduced in both um, those with a deficiency and healthy adults. Lean body mass or muscle is increased. Um, Physical performance actually is reduced in those on growth hormone. There's no change in muscle strength, even though there appears to be an increase in muscle bulk in those who don't have growth hormone deficiency. Although in those who do have deficiency, there's an improvement in exercise tolerance. And then on down, kind of this perceived quality of life in people with growth hormone deficiency, gosh, I should quit, um, quality of life. There, it is improved. So when I treat people with growth hormone who have deficiency, they, they oftentimes feel better if they have low levels. Sleep requirements are reduced. Um, their ability to concentrate is increased in those with deficiency, but actually decreased in those who were healthy to start out with. Fatigue reduced, but increased. And there are a few things that haven't been studied. So I show this primarily because I want people to understand that growth hormone is not the fountain of youth. There are many problems that, come, that can come from the use of growth hormone if used inappropriately. What we also know is that growth hormone treatment increases the risk of diabetes, it increases swelling, it increases joint aches if given in excessive amounts, and there's this concern that it may, if a person develops a malignancy, that it may potentiate the growth of that malignancy. So there are situations where it's important to give growth hormone in a child who has deficiency, in an adult who has deficiency, but given in appropriate amounts. But giving it to a healthy person to try to decrease visceral fat or increase muscle bulk is not appropriate. And interesting, interestingly, a number, uh, about 10 years ago now, the FDA actually decided that this is the one drug that doctors are not allowed to give off-label. So a person has to be proven to have growth hormone deficiency or one of the other clearly defined syndromes where growth hormone helps before they're, they're legally allowed to receive growth hormone. And that was a big change about 10 years ago, and I think an important one. So in my opinion, safety first before using these drugs that have um, significant problems. And this is just kind of an interesting aside. There have been some studies uh, done where people have taken the growth hormone receptors out of a mouse to say, what happens if you just get rid of all the action of the growth hormone? Well, they're short. We know that makes sense because they don't have growth hormone action. But the interesting thing is they live longer 
So these mice that have growth hormone receptors knocked out live, so this is male mouse and female mouse, they live on average another 300 days more than, so that's another 20, 20 to 30 percent more than the average mouse. So things to think about when uh, we're, trying to, we're trying to do things that make us have the fountain of youth, if it actually makes us um, not live as long, may not be the right choice. And then we actually have a um, model of this in humans called um, Lerone syndrome. And these are, these are individuals where their growth hormone receptor does not work, so it's like knocking out the growth hormone receptor in a mouse. So these uh, individuals have been studied. They're, they live in Ecuador. It's a small, small group of people that live in Ecuador who are, have very short stature. And they've been studied for, you know, what kind of problems do they get? What kind of medical problems do they get or not get? And interestingly, there's been, in this group in Ecuador, there's been only one case of non-lethal cancer, no lethal cancers in this group, and nobody has diabetes. And compared to other relatives who don't have Lerone syndrome, the other people without Lerone syndrome died of cancer 20% of the time, and about 5% of them had diabetes. So these individuals appear to be protected from some really serious medical issues. So that's just kind of an interesting aside. So now the flip side of growth hormone. We've talked about not making enough growth hormone or um, growth hormone not working. The flip side is too tall. When do I go to? I go to 1030, right? So this was the uh, tallest man in history, Robert Wadlow, 8 feet 11 inches tall. And these are the current tallest living uh, man and woman. Um, Sultan Kosin's in Turkey and Yao Defen is in China. So all of these individuals have a disorder that we call acromegaly, which is too much growth hormone. And they developed this problem before their bones fused. So during puberty, our bones, the end plates of our bones fuse, so we stop getting taller. But if you develop this problem before your bone, ends of your bones fuse, you'll just get taller and taller and taller. And that's what happened with these individuals. So um, acromegaly was first coined in 1886 uh, by uh, Pierre Marie, and then um, subsequently Minkowski in 1887 associated these clinical findings of. So tall stature occurs in a person who develops this problem before puberty. After puberty, if you develop this problem, so if you develop this tumor later in life, you don't get taller. Your bones have fused. You do not continue to increase in size. But your other bones get bigger. Your hands get bigger. Your jaw gets bigger, your forehead gets bigger, and I'm going to show you some pictures of that. Oh, before I do, though, I'm going to show you um, Harvey Cushing is a name that a lot of people have heard of. He was a very famous neurosurgeon. He was particularly interested in understanding pituitary disorders, and for a surgeon, he seemed to be particularly interested in understanding hormones as well, which I appreciate. So he was one of the first to kind of coin this idea that the pituitary gland has syndromes where they make too much hormone versus not enough hormone. So he he was one of the first to kind of describe um, Cushing, the, a disorder we're going to talk about in a minute called Cushing's, as well as the aspects of um, acromegaly, which is too much growth hormone. I throw in here one bit of history, just um, kind of as an interesting anecdote, which was this was one of a couple of Dr. Cushing's helpers, Drs. Crow and Sharp, had been following this gentleman, uh, John Turner, through his life, keep doing that, and found. They, as they say in this report, it was accident oh, I'm sorry, accidentally discovered through the papers that the funeral of John Turner was to take place at 2 p.m. So these doctors were rushed off to the funeral parlor and actually paid the, um, the funeral attendant $50, it says here, to examine his pituitary, and this was done while the service, so I guess he was in the coffin <laughs> in the back, and while the service was going out front, on out front, his uh, helpers were uh, doing an anatomy exam of the pituitary. So um, this was, we think, done without consent of the family, so it certainly shows that things have changed over time and how, uh, what's appropriate to do in terms of learning things in science. So it, it, it's just written in here in, uh, in small print. This was done in, uh, in the undertaker's suite 
while the service was going on, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. So this is an uncommon disorder. Um, there are probably somewhere between 50 and 100 um, per million uh, in the United States at any one time. Oh, I'm sorry, in the, in the world. Yes? Sure does. So most, most of us, that how tall we grow is dependent on our parents. So there are many, many genes that go into determining how tall we'll, we'll grow. Growth hormone is one of them, but only a, only a small portion of what determines our final height. You know that growth chart I showed you a little bit, uh, a little while ago? When pediatricians are seeing kids, they'll put on that graph the heights of the parents to say what we call is the mid-parental mid height, so the predicted height of a child, because genetics is absolutely the most important determinant of how tall we'll grow. But when a person develops either a deficiency of growth hormone or an excess of growth hormone, they'll be completely different from what their family growth, height growth is. So these are some famous individuals that you've seen. Somehow, I didn't, couldn't find famous people with growth hormone deficiency, but it was really easy to find famous people with acromegaly. So, on, and, and wrestling seems to be a, a place that they accumulate. So Andre the Giant and Paul White, the big show. Richard Keel was in a number of the James Bond movies, Moonraker, he was Jaws. Tony Robbins, you know, we all know Tony Robbins and his inspirational speaking. And then Lurch uh, uh, was also, had also had acromegaly. So this, I think, is an interesting, you know, those of us that really enjoy the pituitary, we try to come up with ways that our particular field it was important in history. So some say that Goliath may have had acromegaly. And the reason that it was uh, possible for David to take down Goliath was because he may have had a big pituitary tumor that made it so he couldn't see on the side, so he couldn't see David coming. So, um, may, well, so, Hard, hard to know, but that's, what, that's, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> so um, this, was, this is a classic picture that was in the New England Journal of, in 99 that showed these were actually identical twins, one of which developed a growth hormone-secreting pituitary tumor before puberty. So you can see he's a lot taller than his brother, and if you look closely, he has m much larger features. His jaw's bigger, his, his forehead's bigger, his hands are a lot bigger. So that's, that's kind of the classical presentation. Here's some kind of more presentation of acromegaly. Bigger jaw, widening teeth, so the jaw continues to grow out, so the teeth start to space. People will have, develop an underbite of their teeth. They'll get skin tags. Their hands, are get, hands will get bigger. Sleep apnea, actually, let me go forward a little bit. Um, this just shows uh, some films of the skull. You'll see the jaw in the first one is protuberant. You can, if you look up on top of this picture, this is the skull. Normally the skull is about a third to half that size, but this person has a really thick skull. And this is the heel pad, so not only do the bones get bigger, the soft tissue gets bigger, so really large hands and feet in these individuals. So in addition to just kind of what we see on the outside, there are also a number of problems that occur on the inside. The internal organs also get bigger. The heart gets bigger, the liver gets bigger, the colon gets longer. Um, the bones around the joints grow inappropriately, so now the joints don't work as well as they should, so there's a lot of arthralgia, a lot of, a lot of um, joint pain. Growth hormone. As I told you before, you've got to be careful with taking growth hormone because it cause di can cause diabetes. People with acromegaly get diabetes. Sleep apnea is common because it causes an overgrowth of the tissues in the neck. So it's a, it has a lot of unfortunate medical comorbidities that go along with growth other than just kind of getting taller and having your hands and feet get larger. So how is acromegaly treated? Surgery is the primary therapy to try to remove the majority of the tumor. But unfortunately, by the time these tumors are found, oftentimes they're very big. And as I told you before, when tumors get out to this spot, they cannot safely be removed. So oftentimes we have to give them medicines that decrease growth hormone production or block the effect of growth hormone. And thankfully, in the last 10 years, there's a new drug that's that's become available that can block growth hormone action that works in many, many cases. So that has really changed how we manage these pe people. We used to, used to have to radiate all of the people 
um, that we could not get all of the tumor out of and where this medicine that blocks growth hormone production didn't work. And radiation has its own uh, downsides. So it's ni always nice to have new drugs that come available for us to be able to treat these specific disorders. So this is, this is the picture I told you I'd show you. It is, the surgery on the pituitary can be done in a couple different ways, either through the nose or through the mouth, which is up underneath the top lip, and you get to the same place. You go through the sinus, through the, through the nasal cavity, back to this area we call the sphenoid sinus, which is just an air-filled hole behind the nose, and then the pituitary sits right behind that sinus. So from, a, from an anatomic perspective, I'm no surgeon, but from what I understand, it's actually a relatively straightforward path to get back up to this area. You don't have to come down through the brain, which is really good when you don't have to worry about um, affecting vascular structures in the brain to get to this spot that's very deep within the head. So I'm, this is just one quick thing. One of, the, one of the hardest things about diagnosing someone with this problem early on, before they have all those changes, is noticing these subtle changes. People just think their hands are getting bigger, or their feet are get, feet's getting bigger, or they're just having normal changes of aging. So what we need to be able to figure out are ways to help primary care doctors be able to notice these changes in their patient. And it's very hard to do that, because when you watch somebody change over many, many years when you're seeing them, you don't notice the subtle changes. So there actually have been some computer algorithms that have been uh, described where the computer can take pictures of people over time and decide who looks like they're having changes that may be suggestive of having acromegaly. So this was a study done where they compared um, physicians who were really good at, who, who were experts in acromegaly versus primary care doctors versus the computer. And overall, the computer was able to classify those with acromegaly about 82% of the time the experts 72% of the time, and the intern is about 65%. So the computer's better than the experts and the uh, primary care doctors. So my idea is at some point, we're just going to put, you know, search um, uh, Facebook, everybody's picture on there, <laughs> and then there's going to be an advertisement for my clinic on the side, and it's going to pop up, and they're going to be able to say, I need to go to see her because I've been told that I have this, this issue based on this. We'll see. We'll see. If anybody's good at that kind of uh, computer programming, let me know. All right, now I'm going to switch gears to go to the um, next hormone called cortisol. Cortisol gets a lot, also gets a lot of uh, uh, kind of undue uh, praise or uh, discouragement in, on the internet. So in the same way uh, that I told you at the beginning that the brain controls the pituitary, controls the end or end gland, cortisol is controlled by a hormone from the brain called CRH, stimulates the pituitary to make ACTH, which stimulates your adrenal glands to make cortisol. And this is how we make cortisol in our body, pulsatile. Bursts. Every few minutes, we release a burst. So a random measure of, of cortisol is not very helpful. You might catch it when it's up. You might catch it with a, when it's down. They're both normal. Over the course of the day, though, you're a lot more likely to catch in a burst early in the morning. And as the day goes on, we kind of peter out. And then at nighttime, our cortisol levels are very low. And we go to sleep, and our levels are low. They're around midnight. And then they start revving up again at about 3 or 4 in the morning, and that probably helps us get out of bed in the morning. So this is what happens to cortisol during stress. So if a person is injured or has a serious... Oh, I'm sorry, you can't see that very well. So if they're injured or they have an infection, the cortisol levels go way up. And this is why they go up. So. Normal physiology, what cortisol does is it maintains normal blood, pressure, blood sugar, blood pressure, keeps us kind of awake. Um, in a stress response, it really increases blood sugar, keeps our blood pressure higher, because many of the illnesses that we get, infections, serious illnesses, cause our blood pressure to drop. So cortisol comes on to try to help increase the blood pressure, causes you to hold on to sodium and water in order to, again, to help keep your blood pressure higher. Um, Break, there's a lot of muscle breakdown to try to mobilize amino acids to be used for fuel in the setting of stress. 
decreased bone formation because bone is thought to be not that important when we're dealing with a stressful situation. Cortisol actually suppresses the immune system a little bit. And it also redistributes fat to what we, these central stores because supposedly when fat's in the central store, it's quicker to be utilized for energy when we're sick. So this is all well and good if we're sick for a few days or, and so we have high cortisol levels for a few days. The problem is when we have a tumor that makes us make too much cortisol all the time. And so if you take all those things that I talked about, the high blood sugar, the high blood pressure, the redistribution of fat, the decrease in muscle, you end up having a presentation um, that has been called Cushing syndrome. So this was the Dr. Cushing's that I mentioned before. This was his kind of um, baseline case of Cushing syndrome. Her name is Minnie G. And she was found to have this particular body type where fat was centrally distributed, so around the belly, here under the chin, above the, above the uh, collarbones, up on the back, and then really thin extremities, thin arms, thin legs, because of the muscle breakdown that occurs from excess cortisol. So I'm just going to run through a few pictures here of what we see. So in addition to having fat be redistributed to the face, this, this woman down below, you'll also see they get um, kind of ruddy facial complexion. Oftentimes the red blood cell count is higher. These stretch marks called stria are often quite wide because the, um, the tissue, the collagen, also becomes very um, uh, sensitive to breakdown. And this is a young boy that uh, developed Cushing's with central weight and thin extremities. And then when a child develops Cushing's, so back to a growth curve, um, again, you'll see in Cushing's, the difference between this patient and the last one was you also see this kind of drop off in linear height because you're, you're not building bone the way you should. But in kids with Cushing's, their weight will go up and up and up because it, the, too much cortisol causes their metabolism to decrease and for them to hold on to, the, to their energy stores and to concentrate that into their, um, into, around their face and around their abdomen. <coughs> So the, for the treatment for uh, pituitary Cushing, so what happens in uh, the reason why people get this disorder is because they have a tumor in their pituitary making the hormone ACTH that's then stimulating their adrenal gland to make too much cortisol. You can also get Cushing's by having a tumor in your adrenal gland that makes too much cortisol as well. And you'll have the same presentation, clinical presentation. But if a person has a pituitary tumor making too much ACTH, that surgery that I mentioned is what's done. In, Thankfully, these tumors are usually quite small, so the surgeon can do a good job of eliminating the problem with surgery in most cases. If not, we don't have as good of medications for too much uh, ACTH as we do for too much growth hormone, but there are a few new ones that are on the market now. Um, we usually go right to pituitary radiation, or sometimes we try these medicines to block either ACTH production or cortisol production at the adrenal, or to block the effect of cortisol out in the body. And then finally, we have kind of an end, thankfully, an end thing that we can do in people with really severe cortisol or if we can't get it under control, we can actually just take out their adrenal glands. So the bottom line is that they're making too much cortisol. We essentially can always fix that by taking out their adrenal glands. The problem is we switch them from having too much cortisol to having no cortisol now. But it is a lot easier to replace cortisol than it is to bring cortisol down from a medical management standpoint. You've probably heard of Addison's disease, which John F. Kennedy had. He was on cortisol replacement because he had um, autoimmune destruction of his adrenals. So if we get to this point of taking out somebody's adrenal glands, we generally need to then what we do is put them back on uh, synthetic cortisol, which works very well in most cases. So I'm kind of. Kind of, I'm going to make, I'm going to make one more statement if that's all right. Am I running? Should I quit? <laughs> okay. All right. So I've got the soapbox now, so I'm going to use it. <laughs> so, um, as you may know, you cannot turn on the television at all anymore <laughs> without seeing an ad for testosterone. It, um, it's everywhere. So um, this was a, a little study that came out just this year showing the rise in testosterone prescriptions over the last decade. 
And you can see there was a real inflection there in 2008. And there's been about a three to five fold increase in the number of testosterone prescri prescriptions in all ages, so that the, all men are in the green, but particularly in men age 60 to 69, a real spike. Now, one can take a couple of views of this, I think. One is that we were really bad at deciding which men had low testosterone, and we were missing them, and that now we're finding all these men who have testos low testosterone or that with all of the direct-to-consumer marketing that's going on now, that now more men, more men are being told they have low testosterone even when they don't truly have it. And this study actually looked at how many men had actually even had a testosterone level checked before the prescriptions were started, and it was only about 75%. Now, 75% is okay, but it should be 100% if you're going to diagnose a man with low testosterone and give him a drug that can have significant side effects. So I just want to comment that around 2008, there were two new testosterone drugs on the market, so which made for now four testosterone gels and a patch on the market. So I just have some concern when I see a significant rise in testosterone prescription that correlates significantly with new drugs on the market. So I want to be cautious, though, because the, all the data is not in yet about what should we do about testosterone. It is a really controversial and contentious subject because men, I think, want to have a reason for having fatigue and low energy. Um, and they want it to be something that's easily treated. And that makes perfect sense, so I understand that. But the question is, is it truly the cause? And is it safe to do? And that we don't know yet. So what we do know is that testosterone levels definitely do decline based on certain physiologic things. Age. We, this is looking at testosterone levels in men over time. So this is what we call total testosterone and free testosterone. And free testosterone is actually what should be measured in men, not just total. And it, t free testosterone clearly does decline in men over time to a, to a pretty low level. It's a, so at age so 70 to 80, it's a third of what it was at age 20 to 30. The other problem is that there are a number of things that are, have become more common that also are associated with lower testosterone. Obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, which is obesity, diabetes, lipid I issues, and blood pressure, elevated blood pressure, and sleep apnea. All those problems have been independently shown to be associated with low testosterone in men. So we're not what we think is that the obesity, diabetes, sleep apnea cause low testosterone, not vice versa, because when men lose weight and their diabetes goes away and their sleep apnea goes away, their testosterone returns to normal. So there's, right now there are a lot of arguments to say, but maybe the testosterone will help men to be able to lose that weight and feel better. But we don't clearly have data to prove that that is beneficial. And just last week, so this is kind of hot off the presses, and it's something I think we all are worried about to some degree, is we don't truly know it's safe. So I think we learned a lot from the Women's Health Initiative, which was the large study looking at postmenopausal hormone replacement. So up until 2003, many women were started on postmenopausal hormone replacement with the idea that it was going to improve heart disease risk and decrease stroke risk. And what we found out is that actually the opposite was true. And that was not at all what was expected with the Women's Health Initiative. We don't have any data for testosterone in men to be able to give us that kind of insight that the WHI told us over years of hormone replacement in women. But I'm concerned that in 15 to 20 years, with this rapid rise in testosterone use, that we may be seeing a similar phenomenon of increased cardiovascular risk. And this is just one study, so I, I want to be cautious. You don't ever make decisions based on one study. But this was a study that came out looking at men who actually had an increased 
uh, likely of, have, of having cardiac disease because they had had a cardiac cath. And then watching those men over the next 2,000 days after their cardiac catheterization. So that compared the men on testosterone versus not on testosterone. And this is determined how many had either death, a, a, a heart attack, or a stroke. And those who were not on testosterone were less likely to have any of those problems in the 2,000 days following their catheterization. That wasn't studied and looked at in this particular study, but it's also a concern. So whether testosterone is going to stimulate benign prostate growth, we know that some men have prostate cancer that is sensitive to stimulation by testosterone. Prostate cancer is a very common cancer. So I'm also worried about the possibility of potentiating prostate. I don't, think, I don't know that it gives a man prostate cancer, but I'm worried that it might fuel a prostate cancer that's already present. So there are issues. And just like I said with growth hormones, safety first, I think the same thing needs to hold true with respect to testosterone, that there clearly are men who are deficient in testosterone. They have a pituitary disorder. They were either born with it or acquired over their life or have severely low levels, and I certainly prescribe it. But I'm, I, I'm very cautious about men whose levels are normal or just mildly low to say, we're not certain right now where, whether, what, whether these individuals should be placed on testosterone. All right, so, oh, uh, last thing is, you know, you always have to remember to learn from your students. So one of my fellows came up to me uh, last week and she said, I found this, you know, your, your job is gonna get a lot easier. So <laughs> she's like, the point for the pituitary is in the middle of the big toe. So just by pushing on that, you can deal with all of the problems that come from the pituitary. So, you know, I'm really, I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on that from now on. So with that, I will leave it open to any more questions, if anyone has any. Yes, ma'am. You're saying spinal fluid in the blood at Oh. So um, if we go back here, we might be not so easy, but I'll try to go back. So when you see blood on a pathology report, what that often indicates is that they have had something we call apoplexy. So in very rare cases, these pituitary tumors can literally explode and bleed within. So you're starting with a tumor, and then the blood supply to the tumor becomes disrupted, and they hemorrhage within the tumor. So when, a, when that happens, you usually get this big flow of blood into the pituitary, and then you have a big like bruise in that area, full of blood, a pocket of blood, that then can cause the vision problem. So when that happens, we send a person immediately to surgery to clean out that area. And oftentimes on pathology, they'll see blood. Now, CSF is a hard thing to see on, on pathology. You can, the, the surgeon will say sometimes that they're having what's called a CSF leak when they're doing surgery. Um, the, cerebrospinal fluid sits right on top. So the pituitary sits in a bony cup and has like what I say like a drum head over top. So a, me a membrane called the diaphragma cell that runs on top. And then this stalk that pierces through the drum head but is really tight around it. So when people develop d abnormalities within there, it can open up the um, tight junction around that stalk so that the cerebrospinal fluid can get down into the area where the pituitary sits. So in that situation, when the surgeon goes in there, they'll often encounter cerebrospinal fluid. It's not considered to be an anomaly or that rare. The important thing is to plug up the hole. So when they're done, they stick a little fat, literally stick a little fat at the edge of the bony cup to seal that up again so it doesn't continue to leak. It's pretty common. Dr. Rex, thank you.